Okay, welcome to Mayberry Fine Art. My name is Elise Dawson and I'm hosting us today with Jack Bishop. So in Jack's recent series on view at Mayberry Fine Art Toronto for the past few weeks, um, Jack has painted autobiographical abstractions of his travels with his wife and dog between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. So welcome Jack, I'll just get you to unmute. Hey. Hey, there, you're there, perfect. So let's start off rather simply. Uh, Jack, how did you get your start in art? Uh, well, I guess that depends on how far you wanna go back. Like I went to NASCAD here in Halifax back, uh, you know, between 2003 and 2006 or so. And after graduating, I was making a series of like paintings of parking lots. I was, uh, my interest at the time sort of almost like cubist kind of parking lots like with like multiple views of uh, the cars and and also at the same time I had a series of uh, paintings of people in in shopping carts like running around frantically at the grocery store going through checkouts um, those were sort of like my first like focused like series after after art school thinking a lot about, you know, car culture and consumerism and some sort of big ideas that were impressed upon me. Um, that was sort of my start after school. I mean, if you go back really far, I really like- Yeah, drawing, even further. I really like drawing like Ninja Turtles and like WWF wrestlers when I was young. And, and then uh, when I was a teenager, I was really into like, doing like band portraits and stuff a lot of a lot of pictures of my friends like playing music at clubs and uh that kind of evolved into some landscape painting that sort of thing so yeah so what's a day in the studio like for you now oh. as opposed to you know being in your teenage bedroom drawing portraits of band friends I was talking to my friend about this yesterday. I think that like having a studio was something that I always like needed. Like it's easy in hindsight to think about it because like when I was younger, I almost like had a few years where I was kind of depressed. And I think it's because I didn't have that space to go to. Like I, you know, work in my bedroom and like have an easel or something set up in there, but it's not quite the same remember my mom got mad at me because I got like some paint on this like old carpet in my room and like this like dingy basement that we had but uh yeah so now it's like yeah it kind of it's like what makes me happy like having a place to come to um I get I mean I usually get up and uh have like coffee with my wife in the morning and maybe walk the dog um Recently, we bought a house, so we're a little bit further away. I used to just walk him, the dog, to the studio with me, and that would be how I'd start the day. But now I have to drive, so between her and I, like we pick like who gets the car for the day, or maybe I'll get dropped off here and come, and uh, usually come in around oh in the morning, maybe a little bit later, like around eleven or twelve o'clock, and. Uh, stay for the day. Once I'm here, I'd like to stay here as long as I can. I usually work until about six or seven at night. Well, the daylight is good, you know, like once it kind of gets dark, I find it a little bit harder to concentrate on, uh, I don't know, my eyes get tired or something. Well, yeah, that's true. And also I imagine like there's, there is a difference or do you find a difference between painting by daylight as opposed to like in any kind of artificial light? I do both. I mean, I've got these fluorescent lights that I use in the studio that are supposed to mimic daylight, um, but I have them on and, you know, the light behind me coming through, it's like from the north, it sort of reflects off the buildings across the street that have like this white siding. So we get pretty good, good light here for the most part. Yeah, I mean, I there's something nice about staying up all night and painting as well. I mean, I, I kind of float between the two, I guess. Yeah, there's definitely a romance to that. 
so in the studio, what would you say is your most important artist tool? Um, is there something you couldn't live without in your studio? Probably my palette. <laughs> Just to What's have... your palette look like? What is it made out of? How do you how do you organize your palette? It used to be a lot more organized. Now it's kind of chaos. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, previously I, I, you know, was very good about, you know, mixing paints and organizing colors and scraping it down. And I've kind of gotten, I don't know if I'd say lazy, but I just sort of trained, changed my approach over time that I'm just, you know, it doesn't really matter like what the, how organized the palette is. It's just about like, you know, using the paint up and, and you found an, an, an economy of, of using the palette now, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's just chaos. I've got paint piled up. I've got the acrylic paint and the oil paint all kind of mixed together. I'll, maybe I'll just pick up the- Oh the yeah, paint. sure. We'd love to, a tour. So it's just chaos right oh, now. Look at that. You know, it's when you were saying it's chaos. On the floor and yeah, so. It's not as bad as, have you seen that image of Francis Bacon in his studio? And he's got like broken mirrors and like pallets piled to, to like to the height of him. And there's garbage all over the floor. It's not that bad, Jack, so don't worry. I love those shots of Francis Bacon there's a great one of him like standing in front of like his window with like these you know dainty like curtains and he's using the curtains to like wipe off his like oil paint on so it's just like like dredged in like you know turpentine and like brown and gray colors and yeah it's really funny yeah I'm a big Francis Bacon fan um so we were talking earlier before we started um, about the role of photography in your practice. And you said that you maybe used to use photos before, but now you mostly work from memory. Could you yeah. talk about that? Um, I love using photography as, you know, a tool. Um, back, you know, for about 10 years or so, I was making these paintings of business parks and taking a lot of reference photography of, sort of uh, chain restaurants and uh, gas stations, box stores, that sort of thing. I think I needed the, the photography just, you know, to kind of get some of the branding right and uh, get the right sort of uh, look of some of the architecture. And I'd, but then I'd use the photos by making uh, collages out of them. So it's, um, it, it's a good tool. The uh, I think I got kind of like, it, it's easy to kind of get lost into it, I guess, is the thing. And I've started to get a little bit more dependent on it. Um, but over time, you know, I'm a big color guy, I guess. And I just realized, you know, I was taking like photos of like sunsets or something. And then whenever I'd like, look at the picture, it would never, it would always sort of disappoint me. It wasn't the same as the experience, you know? And after a while I was like, well, I already know like what my favorite colors are and what I almost want to do. Maybe I, I don't need to, to use, to be so reliant on photography and just kind of, I can, you know, maybe push the paint a little bit more. So, so do, you, do you normally just compose on your canvas or do you make sketches beforehand? Um, I have made some sketches, but right now it's pretty, pretty intuitive. I just, you know, lay in some grounds and I've been uh, working small ever since coming back to Halifax and just ha like having uh, several paintings on the go all at once and sort of having one that I start and then maybe get to a certain point that I don't know what to do next and jump to the next one and keeps me keeps me uh producing and like keeps me involved you know you kind of make some decisions and sometimes something works that's unexpected and then you, you can use it again in another painting and uh yeah it helps me from from getting too too fogged down 
What do you mean by bogged down? Oh, well, I mean, some previous work I've, you know, spent a long time on it. Like some of my older paintings I would work for a couple months on mm -hmm. to the point where it almost felt like it was labor, you know, and, uh, you know, it, there's, there's a great deal of like satisfaction I get out of like putting all the time in, but, um, yeah, it sort of became, became work. So like, I, I want to have fun with my, my painting too. Like what's, what's the point of it if you don't enjoy what you're doing? Yeah, totally. It's like, why torture yourself? Yeah. I mean, that's such a tired stereotype anyway, the tortured artist. Yeah, I think um, I was a bit nope, of a mess for a while. <laughs> you, you were a tortured artist for a little bit of a while? Well, just, I was torturing myself, like, just, you know, layers and layers and, like, you know, some of these paintings are just, like, the work that went into them was real. <laughs> totally. So... In your latest series, you're painting a lot of the open road with huge skies, kind of some electric pinks, yellows, greens. Um, why did you decide to paint a series portraying your partner, your dog, and I think it's a Hyundai Elantra? Yeah. Um, well, I guess it was in like late 2019. Uh, my wife and I got married. We've been together for uh 17 years now but we only got married like two years ago and at the time i was just like you know kind of tying back to like some of that previous work i was getting a, a little bit tired of like, like um the stuff i was making and felt like maybe it wasn't honest anymore like i wasn't uh really inspired by by some of the stuff and just wanted to like you know simply just like to kind of pay homage to like you know us and like make portraits and I thought that you know portraits were like sort of a, a vain thing especially self-portraits you know for a long time but somehow I found my way back to it um and for a long time I've been you know like the highway paintings were like something that I've been um coming back to for a long time but like these paintings seem like it's like looking like it, it's like a portrait of us instead of, you know, looking at the landscape. It, they're more portraits than anything. It's uh, like about you being situated in a landscape. Yeah. Yeah. I always kind of like the idea of like the, the painting, like not being like after like a specific place, but with these paintings like that's even more so because it's just like the landscape behind it is like a mise-en-scene or something and it's just like a, a backdrop i guess there's a great painting by um uh alex colville that's uh part of the i think it's part of the collection at the agns here in halifax but it's called uh dog and car and it's just kind of this like candid shot of a dog riding in the back seat of a car and uh, the driver kind of just has their head turned. Um, and I, I really love that painting and I kind of wanted to make my own version of it. So I made this painting of myself and my dog in the car and it was meant to be just sort of a one-off but from that painting like I basically launched it into like an, an entire series. Um, and thinking about like some other like kind of folky painters like Maude Lewis and like the way that those paintings are of like the the two folks riding in the car and there's a great painting by uh, Maxwell Bates it's called Beautiful BC and that painting has like a a woman sort of like visible through the the back the back windshield of the car um, so I was kind of like thinking of, of some of these, these other painters and paintings for inspiration and, um, just kind of like launched into it, you know, and if it's, I think at some point somebody said to me that like, like looking at some older work that 
um, that I wasn't really interested in realism per se. And I was like, oh, well, no, I guess I'm not. But then the more I thought about it, it was like, well, if realism isn't important, then why do I even need to use photographs? And, you know, it was just sort of sent me off on this tangent. So that's kind of where it, it spawned out of anyway. Yeah, that's, I find that interesting. I was going to ask you about your artistic influences, um, but maybe we could talk about this more of the col your color choices, um, since the palette is so important to you and you kind of consider your paintings to be these kind of like psychological self portraits. Like, how did you arrive at this theory or like, did the colors mean certain things to you? Are they like significant in that way? Or does like it all blend together to be representational of like a, a, a portrait of yourself and your partner and your dog? Um, I think that I, I just wanna push push the palette as much as I, I can. Uh, so I've, I've started like favoring like the fluorescence and neon paints. Like it's kind of this contemporary uh, palette. And I like the idea of it, you know, setting it up apart from like a historical kind of a painting. Like the oil paint is such a, a loaded, like traditional medium. Um, but I like the idea of like the paint being this like modern uh, material that I'm I'm using. Like I've I've used the fluorescent paint and then also a lot of uh, iridescent paints, which are like the flashy kind of two tone like metallic colors. Mm -hmm. And it's just sort of a way of like activating the surface of the painting. Like it's like the the paint does the work for me almost instead of having to render and render it's like like the the paint does a lot of the work on its own um yeah i mean like just breaking from breaking from the uh the photographic references it like opens everything up so at first I was just kind of using a lot of like the fluorescent pink that I like because it's just simply like my favorite color. So I was just like painting everything with it. And then from there I was like, okay, well maybe I can try, you know, some different different tones, but use the same, same sort of uh, theory, like, you know, making like yellow or green versions. And from there, I've just kind of kept building on it and trying to like, you know, you know, work within certain color palettes, like an analogous palette or like complementary colors and just kind of whatever works. Sometimes like a combination works and then I'll like use it again and again. But a lot of the time now I find like if I just kind of use like the weirdest colors that I can and kind of just like through the act of painting, like I've have this discovery like aha moment where like something clicks but it, it's good to do something you know different every time to kind of keep me challenged a bit i've got this uh, uh glow in the dark paint that i've been using every now and again which is really fun to use but it's tricky because um you can't really paint with it in the dark so i'll like have a certain plan and then like take it into the, the dark room that I have at the studio and come back and then work back and forth that way. That's so funny. It's like you have to like allow for a lot more accidents or or let the accidents of it inform you how you paint forward. Yeah, some some accidents, you know, that's that's what uh what they're made of, you know, like uh that's what, that's how Peter Doig paints, I think. It's like everything's an accident and they're all just kind of these like marks out of chance that like builds up together. Uh, um, about the titles of your paintings. So how do you choose the names for your paintings and do they inform or complement the content of your work? So like, do you have a title in mind while you're painting or does that arrive later? Um, well, they're all 
like from this series, they're all kind of lifted from some favorite music of mine, like either songs or lyrics. Sometimes I have it kind of ahead of time, like a solid idea, or maybe like while working through it, it'll it'll come to me. Sometimes, you know, it's just that in the evening after I've been to the studio all day that I'm listening to the radio and maybe unwinding and then I hear that song that's like, oh yeah, that's exactly like, you know, giving me that emotional kind of response and I'll like text it to myself so I'll remember it for, for later or for down the road. So I don't really have a particular system. It's just kind of, you know, been, uh, been kind of picking and choosing as I go. Like right now I've got a painting I'm working on of uh, sort of a fall scene thinking about some of the hills back in New Brunswick. And while I was in Toronto, I was listening to uh, some Tame Impala. And there's this great song that they have uh, where one of the lyrics is uh, another season changes. And that just like really hit me like, like, wow, like what a profound kind of vision almost. So like that for that one, I think I had like the idea before the, the paint kind of um, the, before the painting started, but you know, it kind of can go back and forth either way. What about your paintings? Like how do you know when they're finished? Uh, good question. Um, I guess sometimes like when I'm think like looking at a painting and still working on it, I'll get that voice in my head. Like what if like there was this here? And usually if I say that to myself, then I know instinctively like I have to do it instead of, um, you know, like it, it's good to kind of walk away at a certain point and not, you know, overwork things, but uh, yeah, I've completely trash paintings before and other ones I've looked at later and been like, oh, I should have waited before I left that out of the, out of the studio. So yeah, it's, it's tricky, I guess. I like to have a certain amount of uh, variation and mark making and, uh, you know, that sort of pop of color, I guess. Do you have a hard time letting go of your paintings once they're done? Sometimes, I don't know, I, yeah, like anything new is sort of like my baby, I guess, but after I've, got, I've kind of gotten used to like letting stuff go, I guess, because when I sit on them in the studio for any period of time, I, I kind of start to hate them a little bit, but you know, or they just get turned around and I don't look at them but it's, I like to kind of have a, a empty studio rather than like hanging on to stuff. Okay, so do you have, have you had any memorable responses to your work? Like how do other people respond to your work once you let it go? Yeah, the, I mean, for this series, it's been mostly positive. Um, A lot of the time, you know, I'm not there to to hear somebody's response. Like, I guess there's social media and a lot of emojis are involved, but. Um, What's the most common emoji you get? <laughs> fire. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's uh, when, a good one. When I was younger, there was a, a, one of my paintings um, was, uh, it was, uh, into the collection in uh, New Brunswick and like the provincial collection and they had this uh, art show that was going around the province and they were installing it in schools like elementary schools and so I had this painting it was one of my like earlier uh, parking lot car paintings and one of the teachers uh, told me this story about how like a toddler, like maybe like, you know, 
five or six years old, like probably like a grade one student was just like standing in front of my painting for a really long time, you know, like, like I think recess was happening, but he was like in the school, like still like staring at the painting. And that really, that really made me feel good, you know, like thinking about being a, being young and getting excited about art at that age. Uh, children do have like the most authentic responses to work. Um, I see them sometimes in the gallery and because like they haven't grown those filters yet. It's like you get, it's like, well, I'm often reminded of who, like you sort of said, I'm reminded of who I was when I was younger and like sort of like inspired again by them being inspired. Um, mm. Do you have any advice for younger artists? or anyone else out there? Or have you ever been, like, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given about being an artist? Uh, <laughs> hmm. I once had. Sometimes making art isn't easy. <laughs> sometimes making art isn't easy. <laughs> sometimes you gotta, you gotta do the work, I guess. Sometimes, you know, things don't happen as uh, quickly as you want them to, most of the time, like all the time. So those are some recurring kind of mantras, I think, that I've said over the years, I guess. Makes sense. Um, we're arriving at 1.30 now. So I'm gonna ask if anyone has any questions, um, you can put them in the chat. Um, I will just ask Jack maybe one more question. Kevin, I asked him. Um, oh, well, since your music, well, since your art is so influenced by music, you mentioned you've been listening to Tame Impala a lot. Uh, has what else is on your playlist lately? Um, a lot of Kurt Vile. Uh, there's a old Patrick Watson CD in my car that I've been playing flat out. I forgot how much I liked it. And then Patrick Watson, wasn't he, was he the guy who like wore like a tuba or something around him? Like this like weird musical instrument? I, I feel like I saw him at Folk Fest once. I don't know if he, he did that. I think he had a megaphone that he was using to, to sing out of instead of uh, an actual microphone. Mm -hmm. Won the um, Polaris Prize back in like 06 or something, I think. Yeah, I think they have some sort of contraptions that they put together when they were playing some live performances. Um, yeah, but I kind of forgot about them. I just, you know, kind of have a big CD collection. I went digital for a while and then had like, you know, computers fail me. So I've gone back to actually listening to like physical CDs at the studio. It's comforting to know that, you know, they're, they're there. And then, they'll remain there. You won't lose yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I kind of discover old stuff like from my collection or um, even just throwing on like some like uh, like radio, like classic rock songs. Like there's always like a really good one that like gets like mixed into some of the terrible stuff that gets played on there. Like, like uh, Electric Avenue. Which yeah. anytime that comes on, I just like turn that up. I titled one of my paintings from the Mayberry show after that. It's like, okay, yes, this is going to be the next painting. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a good tune. It's one of those songs that I can hear in my head without like, I don't know, making much effort. Yeah. And I guess I, I like that, you know, where these paintings are, you know, they're kind of a little bit indulgent where it's, self portraits and it's you know family portraits and you know outside of the, the colors like I was maybe thinking like oh 
it's nice to have like something else that's relatable in there for other people. So that's sort of why I, I mean, I was already like using like music titles for my paintings for, for years for other ones, but like to actually like make an entire series with it was uh, just a way of kind of like letting people in a little bit more and making it, uh, making it like that, you know, a lot of the time it's, it's like some classic rock that I'll go to just because it's like a, like a well-known thing, you know, like a little bit more universal than, than sometimes it's like maybe more cryptic or personal with like some indie rock or something that maybe not everybody would know. Um, yeah. Well, I think that's a great place to leave it. Um, was there anything else that, do you have anything else coming up? That you'd like to mention? Oh, I think I'm going to be showing some work in Calgary next month and also included in a group show um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So <gasps> I have friends of... there. I'll yeah. Tell them to go. Yeah, I'll tell them to go. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I guess I maybe should just acknowledge that, you know, with the paintings that I've been working on. Uh, I've got a grant recently from the Canada Council, so I'm grateful to the Canada Council for their generous support of my work. And um, I meant to do this right when we started the interview, but uh, I am in Halifax and would like to acknowledge that it is the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, Chibuktuk, and uh, yeah, make sure that that's part of this. It will be included. Thank you, Jack. Thank you again for joining us. And I hope to see you soon, maybe one day in real life. Um, thanks to those who joined us today. And uh, this chat will has been recorded, so it will be placed online after. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, Elise. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Jack.